So I just want to conclude Surah Tutin. Somebody asked a question on Surah Tutin at the end of last lesson that I wanted to um, just touch on and then we'll move on to the Surah before this Surah to Sharh. Right? So I'll just recite the Surah and then we'll go on. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والتين والزيتون وطور سينين وهذا البلد الأمين لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم ثم رددناه أسفل سافلين إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فلهم أجر غير ممنون فما يكذبك بعد بالدين أليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين سلام الله عليكم um, so yes so sister Layla asked a question um, about this verse, I just want to pull up the question again quickly. Um, so, just quickly, what we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, by the وَالتِّينِ uh, وَالزَّيْتُونَ by the fig and the olive. وَطُورِ سِينِينَ وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينَ and by the Mount Sinai and this safe city. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ Certainly, we have created mankind in the best of uh, states and forms. ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ then we returned him to the lowest of the low. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except those who believed and did righteous deeds. فَلَهُمْ أَجْرٌ غَيْرُ مَمْنُونَ For them there is a reward without end. فَمَا يُكَذِّبُكَ بَعْدُ بِالدِّينَ So what will make you deny, what will cause you to deny بَعْدُ After this, بِالدِّينَ uh, What will cause you to deny the recompense. أليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين is Allah not the best of judges right there's actually a number of different ways that you can understand these verses these last two verses you can understand this word the general tafsir is that it is that it refers to the recompense right the deen that we spoke about in Surah Al-Fatiha Yawm Al-Deen right um so that's the one understanding. However, it could also be understood as deen referring to Deenul Islam, the religion of Islam. What will cause you to deny the religion of Islam after this? Right? And then it would be connected to the verse coming after it, which has put two different potential meanings. Is Allah not Ahkamul Hakimi? Now, the word, the root letters Hakaf mean they either come from hukm, which means to judge or pass a judgment, or hikmah, which means a wisdom. That those, those meanings are related to each other, but they are, uh, they are different to some degree. So, ahkamul hakimin can mean, ahkamul hakimin can mean uh, the most correct of those who pass judgment or who judge. Right? Like, if you think of a court of law, you have a court, you have a judge in that court who will give a decree. Right? And then ahkamul hakimin can also mean the most wise of those who have wisdom. Right? And these two different meanings, they relate to the two potential meanings of the previous verse. How is that? If we understand it as what will cause you to deny the deen of Islam, then we will understand that is Allah, meaning the one who legislated that deen of Al-Islam, is he not the most wise? Is he not the most, does he not have the most wisdom of all beings that, that have wisdom? Meaning, is he not uh, yeah, the most wise of, of, of wise beings? Implying thereby that the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always be the wisest thing to do. To fulfill the law of Allah will always be the wisest thing to do. And if that's the case, then why on earth would you deny it? Right? Um, because in, as part of that wisdom, you know, human law, Law amongst human beings is generally a way of legislating to attain the greatest amount of benefit for the most amount of people. And yeah, there may be other different philosophical bases for laws, but generally that's what people want to. Uh, they, they legislate law to uh, benefit themselves and the society uh, in, different, uh, in different ways. 
right? So if we're saying that this, the deen of Al-Islam is the law of Allah, then is Allah not the wisest of those who have wisdom? Thus, you should not deny the deen of Islam. You should adhere to it. That will be a fulfillment of your belief and your, your righteous deeds such that you remain from the uh, those who are fi ahsani taqweem rather than going to those who are asfala safili. The other understanding would be what will cause you to deny the, the recompense, meaning the fact that there will be reward and punishment and reckoning for one's actions in the year after. Right? Is Allah then not the best of judges? Why? Because Allah is the, the one who will pass judgment in the next life on Qiyamah over people in relation to their, uh, to their actions. So that's it. The question was, let me just jump in here. Explain the judge and the day of recompense again. So I hope that answers the question. So the judge and the day of recompense is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, he is the one that will reckon our deeds. He is the one that will make hisab of us, right? And he will decree that this person is deserving of going to Jannah. This person is deserving of the hellfire. This person, he believed, but he must be purged in the hellfire before entering into Jannah, etc. So, so depending on how we understand the word ad-deen, that will determine how we understand uh, the phrase ahkamul hakimin. If we understand it as deenul Islam, the religion of Islam, we will understand ahkamul hakimin as the most wise uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most wise, has the greatest degree of wisdom. Um, and if we understand the word ad deen as a recompense, we will understand the phrase ahkamul hakimin as the best of judges because Allah will be the judge on the day of Qiyam. Does that answer the question? Okay. So what we'll do on what we'll do is we'll move on from David Ta'ala onto the next surah. The next surah that we're doing is actually the surah before. Uh, is actually the surah. One second here. Okay. The surah that we're doing is actually the surah before surah to teen. And so, and this surah that we're doing, surah to sharh, or surah alam nashrah, is a follow-on from Surah Al-Duha in terms of the order of revelation of the Quran. Surah Al-Duha was revealed, I think about 11th Surah or so, and then Surah Al-Sharh was revealed after that. Right? And most of the Mufassirin say that Surah Al-Sharh, it gives a reason for the content of Surah Al-Duha. Now tell me, did you do Surah Al-Duha? Yes, Molana. Molana, Molana. I heard a yes and a no. Now I'm confused. So Molana of the wrong road mosque. That Molana. Forgot yes, Molana. Okay, so you did do Surah Al-Duha, right? And Surah Al-Duha spoke about after the initial revelation when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was feeling down between the uh, the, the re receipt of revelation and the period in which he didn't receive revelation. And, um, you know, Rasulullah spoke about the difficulty that he underwent during that period. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to him, telling him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never forsake him, etc. Right? Now, this surah, the Mufassirin say, surah to sharh is like, it comes in the place of a explanation for the reason of surah to duha. Right? So, it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, or, 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 or proving that, Allah would not start off something in a certain way and then let it conclude in a different way. Right? Allah started from the very onset, Allah has been favoring you and Allah will continue to favor you. Right? <clears throat> Despite the fact that you find yourself now in difficulty, the, how Allah started interacting with you by favoring you, Allah will continue to do that. Um, and so that's the thrust of the surah. Uh, it's the it's the mihwar, it's the the pivot of the surah that Allah subhanahu wa taala is speaking about, um, how Allah favored Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And by extension, the surah is there for us as believers to derive lesson from. And then, what does that, 
what does that favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala necessitate from us? Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so I think uh, Muhammad also did a bit more of an introduction to the surah for you. But that's it. We'll just get into the verses of the surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, I'm going to read through the whole surah because I want to tell you something about the structure of it and then we can move on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, shaytan rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alam nashrah laka sadrak wa wada'na anka wizrak alladhi anqada dhahrak wa rafa'na laka dhikrak fa inna ma'al usri yusran inna ma'al usri yusra fa idha faraghta fansab wa ila rabbika farhab Right. So the two, the, the, the two distinct parts of the surah, uh, the first is from verse number one until verse number six. That's the first section of the surah. The second of the section of the surah is from verse number seven to verse number eight. In the first section of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about his favors upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an explanation for the surah that came before it in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always been favoring Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that despite it may seem like a moment of difficulty now that difficulty never comes void of ease right and then uh, the second part of the surah speaks about what one's response should be to receiving favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a specific focus on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself I just want to point out to you. In the surah, you will see. Do you see? Um, okay. Can you see? We have a cat over here. When I when, when I put something on the screen, right? When I point on the screen with this with this pen, can you see the red dot? Yes, my lord. Okay. So you see, there's a cat over there. There's another cat over there. There's a cat there. There's another cat there. There's another cat there. There's another car there, another car there. That's a whole lot of them. Right? And then we have this faragta. Mm. Do you see there's a lot of in the surah, there's a lot of repetition of the of the second person singular pronoun. Right? So first person or third person is he, she, they. Second person, you. So here we have you with the singular masculine form. Whenever we have that ka, that singular masculine address in the Quran, it generally refers to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? It generally refers to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this surah is no different over here. So what I wanted to point out there is that Allah is constantly addressing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the surah. And the purpose of that repetition of the address to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when somebody speaks to you, I'm speaking to you, 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 it makes you feel important, cared about, loved, right? And that's one of the main purposes of the surah, to show Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that Allah remains with you, right? Not, I'm not speaking about physically and in terms of space, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love is all. And so that's one of the things I want to record in the surah. It's a focus on Rasulullah to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love and care. We can hear you now. Know. Know. But you I don't know where that. Uh, I, I don't know where I. Uh, where you stopped that now. Where did I stop? 
about um, Allah showing love to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, yeah. So why I mentioned that is I just wanted you to to understand the light in which we read the surah, right? And also its relation to Surah Al-Duha. But now let's get into the verses within Allah Taala. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah the most merciful the especially merciful Alam nashrah laka sadrak Alam nashrah laka sadrak Um I want to uh, another thing I want to point out to you in this uh, in the surah is that um Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking in the past tense lam does what it enters upon a present tense verb but it makes it past tense in meaning We'll come back to that in a moment. Wa wada ana past tense. Allah the anqada past tense. Rafa ana past tense. And then it and then from verse number five it switches to the present and future. To a command. Right, um, and that that will do something to shaping our understanding. Uh, in fact, the most of the Mufassirin understand the surah in light of that to mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioning his prior favors to show that he will not cease to continue with those favors. Um, I don't know, can you guys hear my kids? Just, just ask them to make me please. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so Allah says, Alam nashrah. We have three things happening here. We have the ah right at the beginning that makes the sentence into a question. Then we have this thing over here, lam, and we have the word nashrah. Now tell me, in sort of, did you learn about uh, did you learn about the particle lan or lam? Sorry, lam. Uh, yes, Maulana, we did it. Yes, Maulana. Okay. Right. So, so what do you know about lam? Um, number one, it's a, like a negation, and if I'm correct, I think it also um, impacts the, the verb in terms of its ending. Right. So how does it impact it? Instead of having a U, it will have a... It will just, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, sukun. A sukun, that's correct. There we go. Right, it will have a sukun, or if it has a noon added at the end, like yafaluna, then that will fall away. Right, except for the feminine plural, yafalna. That one never falls away, right? So, so that's what it does in form. But what does it do in terms of meaning? It negates it. That's the one part of the meaning. It negates it. What else? Does it make it past tense as well? If it's present it makes before. it past tense. There we go. So, at, in terms of the form, you have the lam there, and it changes the ending, right? To either a sukun or a drop sunun. In terms of meaning, it negates it and it makes it past tense. Those are the important things. And you must also know that it enters only upon a present tense verb in form, but it gives it a past tense meaning. Okay, so now what does the word sharaha mean? Sharaha, yashrahu, means to open something. Oftentimes we use, when, when we say I'm going to give you a sharh of something, it means I'm going to explain something to you. I'm going to explain something to you. But sharh can mean to uh, expand something, to open something. Right? Those are the general meanings of the word. Sharaha yashrahu. Sharaha yashrahu. To expand, to open something. Now, when the word sharaha gets used with the, with the word sadr, right? And you can see here you have the word sharaha and then it's followed up soon after that by the word sadr. What is a sadr firstly? Chest. Okay, sadr can mean a chest. A sadr can also mean your heart. That sadr can also refer to your heart. But it's but the Arabic language has a number of words. <laughs> sorry, the Arabic language has a number of words that we use to refer to a heart. Sometimes we can refer to the heart as the fuad. Right? When we refer to it as the fuad, we, we're speaking about the heart, but from the perspective that it is, that it quickly reacts to things, that it's quickly affected, right? So for example, Allah refers to the heart as the fu'ad when he speaks about uh, the, the, 
you know, Musa alayhisalam's mother feeling fear on account of, uh, you know, letting her son go. فَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qasas. The, the heart of, the fu'ad of the mother of Musa alayhi salam became like empty or it's, it's like she felt this, uh, this fear, feeling of fear. Um, all right, so, so we have the meaning fu'ad. Then we have the word qalb. Uh, qalb. Allah, in that very same verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually speaks about the qalb as well. فَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا uh, And then Allah says, وَلَوْ لَا أَرَّبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا If only, um, if we had not, رَبَطْنَا strengthened her heart, her qalb. So fu'ad and qalb actually refer to the same thing essentially. But it refers to them from different perspectives. It's referring to the heart from a perspective now that it has strength and it can be settled and it can resolve itself on something. After that initial reaction, the heart can settle upon something. Then the sadr can also refer to the heart, but from the perspective that it that it uh, goes through states of like, it can have states of expanse and it can have states of restrictedness. Uh, that's why when Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oftentimes speaks in the Quran about the qusadr, um, the qusadr will mean when you, when you feel restricted, you feel down, you feel uh, almost claustrophobic. Whereas sharh al-sadr is the opposite of that. When you feel ease, when you feel contentment, you feel happiness. So, so when the word sharaha gets used with sadr, it means to feel ease, to feel comfort, right? So, so, so I hope you understand what I'm doing there. I took you from the literal meaning of the word sharh, which means to open or to expand something, to the understanding of the word in the context, which is the word is getting used, the word sharh is getting used with the word sadr, and in that context, it doesn't just mean to open a chest, it doesn't literally mean to open a chest, it's a, it's a famous figure of speech in the Arabic language, which means to feel at ease. To feel comfort. Right. That's important in this verse because there's two very distinct understandings that we can have of this verse. And we'll get to that in a moment, right? But I just want to translate this for now and then we can see what our time is like. So ah makes a sentence into a question. Sharaha means to open. Nashrahu will mean we are opening. Lam nashrah will mean we did not open. If we change it into a question, it will mean, did we not open? Laka, that's harf jar wa majroor. Ismul, or harf al jar, ismul majroor. Laka. Did we not open for you? Meaning for your benefit. Did we not open for you, sadaraka? The fa'il of nashrah will be inside it, indicated by that noon, we, referring to Allah. What's the maf'ul of this verb? The maf'ul is sadaraka. You can see that's in nasb. Did we not open for you your, your chest? Sadarak, sadr chest, sadaraka, your chest. Or you can say, did we not expand for you your chest? Did we not open for you your chest? Or did we not grant you ease? Did we not grant you comfort? Right? Um, okay. So, let me just see. Our time is up. So we're gonna we are going to we are going to stop over there for now. That requires some explanation. Right? That requires some explanation. And I'm going to explain that inshallah in our uh in in, in our next lesson with Ibn Allah Ta'ala. Uh, and I'll frame the entire surah for you in light of those two understandings. But uh so so <laughs> if you don't mind, what I'm gonna do is we can end the class for now, inshallah. Uh and um and once I've created and then Irshad, you may ask your question. So we end there for now. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, you may leave. And uh, Irshad, you may go ahead with asking your question. Bismillah. If anybody else has any questions, I'll stick around. Assalamu alaikum for taking my question. Um, Allah, the question I had was about the, the use of, of Allah Ta'ala referring to himself as uh, we in this case. So I know in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala re refers to himself sometimes in the uh, plural, as like a, a royal pl plural, but 
perhaps some insight into into the context over here why why in this surah in particular Allah Ta'ala uses the, that royal plural the we okay okay I think that's beneficial in light of the, the surah for everyone so can I can I okay. answer that thing next week cool cool no problem Alana Bismillah all right okay did that like I have an unrelated question to the surah, but it's for the for fasting on the day of Arafah. Yes. It's lots of controversy whether Arafah is defined as the day before Eid, so that's Friday for us, or whether it's defined as in the people actually on Arafah. So which day is it? Should we fast? <laughs> and the MJC also sent out the MJC sent out a, a fatwa saying we should fast on Friday. So that is, that's the opinion that the Ummah generally followed throughout time. The ninth of the Hijjah is the day in which you fast. However, the local day. It's, good to fast, it's good to fast every day in these 10 days. Mm. Or, sorry, obviously not the day of Eid, but it's good to fast all of the days. So try and fast both of them. But Maulana, also like for this year we can the, do that, but, but it's possible that uh, our Eid will fall the day before the Eid in, in Saudi, one of the years, then you can't fast both days because then you'll be fasting on Eid, on our Eid. Yeah, so I don't know if it's possible for us because of the fact that we are. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Our, I think our, our, our longitude location. is is different to this. Um, and, and they will generally see the moon before us. But, um, and, and also they use telescopes and we don't use telescopes. So, yeah, um, but... The general opinion of, of, of the Ummah is that you fast on the ninth of Dhul-Hijjah. Um, the, I, I don't want to go into, because this is a controversial issue, and I don't want to just substantiate mm. one view, but um, there is a hadith um, wherein the Sahaba encountered the same issue. Right? Um, in, one, in one region, I think it was in the, in the region of Medina or something like that, uh, they cited the moon on a specific day, and in Mecca they cited the moon on a different day. But because there's, there's a, a long period of time between the beginning of Dhul Hijjah and the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, it's easy to to change things, right? So somebody actually traveled from the one place to another and informed them that they had seen the moon a day earlier. But they said okay. that we're not going to change, uh, we're not going to um, change the day of celebration of Eid, etc., because this is our Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi taught us, or this is our Rasulullah did it. The other thing is that the day of Arafah and the day of Eid that we celebrate, it had virtue before Hajj. Mm. The day of Arafah has virtue from the events of the life of Adam alayhi salam. Right? It's not just particular to that period of Wukuf right, on Arafah and the day of Adha has significance from the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Right? And also that significance existed there before Rasulullah and before the Muslims even went to do Hajj. So we cannot say that the, the events of this day is solely connected to the events that is happening in Mecca on this period of time. Because otherwise, in the initial period when the Muslims had aid, but there were only polytheists performing, uh, there were only polytheists performing uh, Hajj. And there were, the, the Kaaba was filled with idols and they were circumambulating the Kaaba naked. Certainly, the Muslims were not celebrating that. Yes, uh, I see. Um, so so the, the, the connection between the events that's happening on Mecca or in Mecca and the time period, it's not a definitive connection like some people make it out to be. And it was never understood like that by the, uh, by the Ummah throughout time. The, the, the distinction now, whether we have to follow Mecca, it's a very recent thing because of the advancement of technology. Um, because previously we so, had no way to communicate. So. Uh, well, there were ways to communicate. People were traveling from uh, from from one place to another. It's just oh, yes, it wasn't as easy this, as it is now. There's ten days for for the future, but for yeah. other for other times, yeah. there's no time to communicate. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want to add to the the controversy, but we've also fasted previously on on the day of Eid. Um, if you look at Eid al-Fitr, Makkah uh, sighted the moon a day early, and they um, so there are times because of uh, distance and lot, I mean hemispheres and all of that stuff there are times where you are fasting on a day of Eid somewhere yeah so we're not fasting on the day of Eid we're fasting yes. on a day that's not Eid for us they yes. fasting they're not fasting because it's their Eid now um, uh, there's something important to note here also just from a rational perspective that there are certain time uh, zones wherein 
the entire period of wukuf will be in their night time, for example. So they would yes, never yes. possibly be able to fast whilst the hujjaj are making wukuf. So, I mean, even from a rational perspective, the argument doesn't have any weight. And, um, yeah. and it's specifically, I, what, it's, what, the ten, it's the 10 days of the hujjaj that's basic. Yeah, what, what we do say is this. We respect the opinion and the choices of, of, of everyone. So if somebody comes to me, they're having Eid on, on Friday, then I congratulate him for Eid and, I, and our hearts are united. But if somebody comes to me as a, from a scholarly perspective and asks me what's the most correct opinion, then I will say that I believe tomorrow is Eid and I will be performing Eid tomorrow. And I must also say something here. That in mat there's certain matters that's purely fiqh. And there's certain matters that require authority. Now, the announcement of Eid are one of those matters wherein you require the announcement of an authority. For example, from a fiqh perspective, if I cite the moon, I individually, on say for example, it's the 29th of, uh, we fast the 29 days of, of Ramadan, I then go out and I cite the moon. Myself, I see the moon. But my citing doesn't have, it's not sufficient for, or it's not accepted for some reason. Um, maybe my maybe I have you know ex extremely good eyesight, um, like abnormally good eyesight, and and it doesn't fulfill or whatever the conditions are. There isn't a you know a, a large group of people that sighted the moon, etc. And my individual sighting is not considered by the hakim or the judge in this regard. Then I, as an individual, I mustn't have eat the next day. I also mustn't fast the next day, because I know I sighted the moon. So as an individual, I'm content with my sighting. I don't fast on the 30th day of Eid, but I also don't have Eid because Eid is, Eid is the day that the judge announces that it's Eid. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the first of Shawwal. And I know okay. that's getting into a little yeah, bit more yeah, detail. That, that, that's, a, that's a strange one. So, okay, so you, you don't fast, but you also just don't keep Eid. Because okay. Eid is when the people have Eid is when 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 it's announced that it's the day of Eid. Uh -huh. But because I'm certain in my sighting of the moon, I, I I don't waver. I actually saw the moon myself. Then, as an individual, I don't go broadcast to other people and tell them that you also mustn't fast. But as an individual, I don't fast. Okay. And is there anything anything in the fiqh that um, that um, doesn't allow us from using the sighting from the like neighboring countries at the moment? <clears throat> There's different opinions in relation to that matter, right? So, so because there's a, there's a plurality of opinions on the issue, in, in every region, you have to decide on one. Now, we can technically accept the sightings of, of, of neighboring countries. We certainly can. And in fact, that was a discussion amongst the, the bodies, the, the moon sighting bodies for Dhul Hijjah. But they agreed that they didn't want to change it now. And so they went with, uh, you know, Restricting it to the, the sightings within South Africa. The reason for that is a, is a reason of unity, right? A regional unity. So instead of breaking the unity where some people is going to be accepting the, the, the sighting outside and others are not, we have a large majority of people that have agreed upon historically the fact that we're going to go with a certain, uh, a certain uh, region of sighting and that's why they, that's why they go with it. Okay, the fiqh so allows for both. The fiqh allows for you to look at the, the region. And the fiqh also allows you to, uh, you know, to go beyond that, look at lines of, of longitude mm. and latitude, etc. In fact, those opinions are stronger. But because of the, the agreement with the rest of the country, that that's the procedure. That's why the, uh, the ulama go with that. Okay. 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 Eid, inshallah, we'll see Muladin. I mean, time. all of you as well. Sorry, I, I forgot to mention everybody must have a blessed Eid and keep us in your du'as, whichever day it may be. You know, these, these, these 10 days are. And the 10 nights are the most blessed 10 days and nights of the entire year. The only night that, uh, you know, supersedes it is the night of Qadr. But as, you know, a, a series of 10 days or 10 nights, these are the most blessed of them. Do lots of good deeds and keep us in your du'as as well, inshallah. Oh, okay. as Muladin. Shukran. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh maulana. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right, I'm going to be off then, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.